Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Museum Munchkins. I'm Mr. Nick, and today we are talking all about fossils, because I don't know if you know it, but today is National Fossil Day, and we're going to start off by singing a fossil song if you want to stand up on your feet. All right, now this song sounds a little bit like if you're happy and you know it, but we're going to pretend like we're a whole bunch of different prehistoric animals all living in a prehistoric coral reef under the ocean. All right, so there's going to be lots of different animals that we're going to pretend to be in our song, but so we're going to listen for the different animals and then what the action is to pretend like we're being those animals. Are you ready to sing our song? All right, here we go. So our first animal we're going to be is a trilobite. Trilobites are small little animals that crawl around on the ocean floor. So if you're a trilobite, crawl around. So if you don't want to get down on the ground, you can still just use your fingers to crawl around. If you're a trilobite, crawl around. Oh, well, fossil day is here, so everybody cheer. If you're a trilobite, crawl around. Very good. Need some crawly little trilobites. Now the next animal we're going to be is a crinoid. Crinoids are kind of like sea stars but they're attached with a long stem to the ocean floor. And so they kind of wave around like this. So if you're a crinoid, give a wave. If you're a crinoid, give a wave. Oh, well, fossil day is here, so everybody cheer. If you're a crinoid, give a wave. And we can wave and sway in the ocean currents. Very good. Now, swimming around all those trilobites and crinoids, we've got some little squids. So, if you're a little squid, swim around. If you're a little squid, swim around. How are you swimming around? You can swim like this, or you can swim like this, like a squid. Oh, well, fossil day is here, so everybody cheer. If you're a little squid, swim around. Very good. Oh, now, coral reefs are covered with animals called corals. Now, corals don't move very much. So if we're going to be corals, we need to practice standing really still like a statue. So if you're a fancy coral, stay real still. If you're a fancy coral, stand real still. Oh, well, fossil day is here, so everybody cheer. If you're a fancy coral, stand real still. Frozen. Very good. Now, we've got one more animal. Now, if you've visited our museum before, you might have seen in our coral reef that there is a big, giant fish with big, giant jaws. So if you're a giant fish, snap your jaws. If you're a giant fish, snap your jaws. Oh, well, fossil day is here, so everybody cheer. If you're a giant fish, snap your jaws. Very good. Excellent job singing that song with me. Thank you so much. I'm going to set my guitar down so that we can talk all about fossils today. Let me set it right over here on my guitar stand. And yeah, like I said, so today is National Fossil Day. Happy Fossil Day, everybody. Did you know that today was a holiday even? Yeah, so it's a wonderful holiday. It's one of my favorite days of the year. And today is a very special day where people all around our country learn and talk all about fossils, just like we're doing today on Museum Munchkins. And if you're watching and you think of a question that you might want answered about fossils while we're talking, you can leave that in the comments and we're going to answer some questions in just a little bit. But first, since we're talking about fossil day today, have you ever heard that word before? Fossil? Do you know what a fossil is? 
Can you say that word with me? Fossil. Yeah, fossil. So let's talk about, about what a fossil is. So a fossil is a clue that tells people about life, what life used to be like a long, long time ago. Thousands or sometimes even millions or billions of years ago. So fossils are really, really old sometimes, and they tell us what our planet used to be like. They're clues that help us fill in that part of the story that we weren't around for. And we find tons of different types of fossils. Can you think of any types of fossils that we might find? So there are dinosaur bones and teeth and claws and shells and leaves and wood. Those are all great examples of different types of fossils that we can find. Now, we find fossils. Do you know where we find fossils? So here's where our museum is in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So we find fossils around here, but we actually find fossils all throughout Wisconsin, all throughout the United States, all throughout North America and Central and South America, in Africa and Europe and Asia and Australia. We even find them down in Antarctica where it's really cold, where there's penguins and things. So we find fossils all over the world. In fact, you can find fossils just about anywhere that you find the right type of rock. So fossils are preserved inside a type of rock called sedimentary rock. Ooh, that's a really long word. Can you try saying that word with me? Sedimentary. Let's try it one more time since it's so long. Sedimentary. Very good. So sedimentary rocks are rocks that are made when uh, the earth takes mud or sand or silt or clay and presses it together really hard for millions of years. That rock gets, or that, that sand and stuff gets pressed together and it gets pressed together for so long, so hard that it turns into rock. And sometimes there are things that are trapped inside that mud or sand or clay that those things then turn into fossils. So basically, anywhere in the world that you can find sedimentary rocks, you can find fossils. Now, we don't find the same fossils all over the place, but it depends on what type or how old the rocks are where you live or that you're around, that you're looking for fossils inside, um, and what the environment was like when those rocks were made. So around here in Kenosha, we find a lot of different types of fossils, and a great place to look for fossils is actually right along the beach of Lake Michigan. So have you ever been to the lake before? So right along where the water is way, the waves of the water are crashing up onto the beach, we can look through those rocks that are washing up out of the lake, and we can find fossils. But how exactly do we go to the beach and look for fossils? What are things that we're looking for? Well, I'm going to teach you how to go to the beach and actually look for fossils of your very own. And I've got this big box of rocks to help me out. Now, I'm going to grab a couple different rocks here so we can see. So the first thing, and I'm going to get a little bit closer, the first thing that we look for are different shapes. Now, not just the, the shape of the rocks themselves, but shapes of things that are inside the rocks. So if we take a look at these two rocks here, do you see any shapes? So in one of the rocks, in this rock, I don't really see any shapes. I see some different colors, but not really any different shapes. But look at if we take a closer look at this fossil here, at this rock, we can see lots of little shapes, lots of little circles. So this, this fossil is like kind of a circular fossil, really small and round. So circles are one shape we can look for. Can you think of any other shapes? Yeah, there are squares 
and rectangles and circles and triangles and pentagons and hexagons. Yeah, there are lots of different types of shapes. Rhombus even you might be thinking of. That's a fun, I like that saying that shape's name. So there are lots of different shapes that we can look for, but usually we're looking for different shapes inside the rock, not just of the rock itself, but inside the rock. Now the next thing that we'll look for are colors. So can you think of any colors? I bet if someone asked you, you could think of a lot of different colors. Do you know all the colors of the rainbow? We could, we could say all the colors of the rainbow. There's red and orange and yellow and green, blue, indigo, and violet. Those are all the colors that we find in the rainbow. But when we're looking for fossils, we're not usually looking for big, bright colors like we'd find in a rainbow. We're looking for colors that are a little bit more subtle to see. That means they're a little bit harder to see. So let's take a look at our two rocks again. And what sorts of colors can you see? So in this rock, I see some browns and oranges, and tan, and maybe some white even. So there's lots of different colors on here. But do we see any of those shapes inside our rock? No. But if we look at this other rock again, we can see not only those circles, but what color are those circles? Yeah, the color, those circles are kind of a whitish color, sometimes even a pinkish color. And then the rock that they're stuck in is more of a gray color. So fossils, and we'll find that a lot, that fossils are sometimes or usually a different color than the rock that we find them stuck inside. So those are two things that we look for, are shapes. The second thing we look for is colors. And then there's a third thing that we can look for too. So sometimes around here looking for fossils, this third one isn't the most useful, but it is useful for looking for fossils in general. And that third thing is texture. Ooh, that's an interesting word. Do you know what that word means? Texture? So texture is how something feels. Is it hard or is it soft? Is it bumpy? Is it smooth? Like if we feel, can you hold up your arm and you can feel your arm? What kind of texture does your arm have? So my arm, my arm is, I can feel the hard bone inside there, but it's kind of soft on the outside. Yeah, or I can feel my table here in front of me that's got some carpet on it, and the carpet is soft, but it's also kind of bumpy. It's got these little ridges in it. I could feel the floor, and that would feel hard and smooth. So there are lots of textures on things. You can feel your couch or your door or the sidewalk outside. Everything's got textures to it, how it feels. And sometimes... Fossils are a lot smoother, like especially dinosaur bones. Those are a lot smoother inside the rocks than we, than we find other fossils. Some fossils, like lots of corals, have lots of little bumps on them. So they're going to feel a little bit bumpier. But we're looking for different textures too. So those are the three things that we look for when we go out looking for fossils. We look for shapes and colors and textures. And if you want to go out looking for fossils yourself along the beach of Lake Michigan, we actually have a handy guide on our website that you can go to and find uh, a whole, a, a, a nice simple guide that helps you to find the different fossils that we have um, around here in Lake Michigan. Now, do you remember what we said a fossil is? A fossil, right, a fossil is just a clue that helps us learn about life from the past. So what sorts of fossils do we find around here that could help us learn more about the past of Kenosha? Well, we talked about some of the fossils in our song at the very beginning of our show today. We have, we find trilobites around here sometimes. And trilobites were those little animals that scuttle around on the ocean floor. We find lots and lots of crinoids, those little round circular white fossils that I showed you. Those are fossils of 
crinoids, so all these little tiny circles are pieces of their stem that would hold them to the ocean floor. Remember, those were the, the animals that like to wave around in the water like that. So we have trilobites and crinoids, and we also find lots of shells uh, and things like, that are related to clams and stuff, things called brachiopods. We find lots of those animals that live down in the ocean. And occasionally, very occasionally, we might find part of a squid shell. And we find a lot of corals, a lot of different corals from, the, from, a, from a coral reef from under the ocean. So if we find all of those different animals here, squids and corals and crinoids, those wavy crinoids and trilobites that crawled around on the ocean floor, does that give you any clues as to what Kenosha might have been like a long time ago? Yeah, Kenosha used to be under the ocean. So let me get my globe again. So here's where Kenosha is now. But a long time ago when these fossils were made, <coughs> Kenosha was actually underwater and it was a lot further south. It was about here, kind of where the Bahamas are today. So Kenosha used to be a lot further south and it was underwater, covered by a warm tropical ocean with a big giant coral reef system that was here. Pretty interesting. So even though Kenosha looks a lot different than that today, and it's even in a different place, um, we still can know what the, the story of Kenosha was like because of the fossils that we find. That's, and that's one of the reasons that I really love to find fossils and go looking for fossils to learn more about that story of what our planet used to be like before we got here. And now I've got a story for you about a little girl who really liked to find fossils too. This is a story called When Sue Found Sue. And it's by Tony Bezeo and it's illustrated by Diana Sudaika. Sue Hendrickson was born to find things, missing trinkets, prehistoric butterflies, sunken ships, even buried dinosaurs. If it was lost, Sue's curiosity led her on a hunt to find it. Look at all these different things that she likes to find. Sue began searching for lost treasure when she was mighty small. She was born shy and incredibly smart. Treasure hunting was the perfect job for a shy girl. When she was young, she would walk alone through the alley behind her home in Munster, Indiana, with her head down. She was on a mission to find things, and she often did, like the little brass perfume bottle. She's never lost. Can you see a little brass perfume bottle? kind of glowing, it's so shiny. Sue wasn't like other kids, so shy and smart, she gobbled up books the way other kids gobbled up ginger snaps. Head down, a book a day, Sue learned things all on her own. She dialed her curiosity up to high and discovered everything about anything that interested her. Sue's curiosity led her to visit the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. She loved to view the endless supply of treasures that other hunters, maybe shy outsiders themselves, had already found. Sue couldn't wait to grow up and search the wide world for hidden treasure on her own. At the age of 17, she launched her life of discovery traveling, living outdoors, supporting herself, and finding things. One curiosity always led to another, and for the first time, Sue joined teams, teams of curious, dedicated treasure hunters. 
diving first for tropical fish and then for lost boats, lost airplanes, and even lost cars eventually led Sue to search Dominican amber mines for extinct prehistoric butterflies, to search the deserts of Peru for prehistoric whale fossils, and finally, finally, to search the hills of western South Dakota for dinosaur fossils. For four long, hot, dusty summers, Sue dug for duckbill dino fossils, taking down the big rocks with a shovel and pick, then freeing the bones, first with a rock hammer, then with a digging knife, then with an exacto knife and a tiny pick, and finally dusting the area with a paintbrush to remove all traces of rock from the bone. No showers for washing, no beds for sleeping, no escape from the beating sun, but still, Sue was part of a team. She loved the work, the discovery, and the chance to be curious and find things. During the last weeks of her fourth summer of digging for duckbills, in the blistering heat, Sue Hendrickson felt pulled to a sandstone cliff far off in the distance. She couldn't say why then, she can't even say why now, but she was called to that cliff. And on August 12, 1990, when her team headed into town to fix a flat tire, Sue finally followed her curiosity. She and her golden retriever, Gypsy, left camp alone that morning in a dense, misty fog, so unusual in the hot, dry plains. They hiked for four hours, across seven miles of rugged prairie land before they finally reached the rock face Sue had been so curious about. Sue and Gypsy stood below the 60-foot high towering cliff of tan and gray rock. I walked around the base of the cliff with my head down, watching the ground. About halfway along, I noticed a few pieces of what looked like bones. Then I looked up. Sue stared up the th at three enormous backbones. One, two, three. Protruding from the cliff eight feet above her, she felt a thrill run through her. Could it be? It was hard to believe, but Sue knew by their incredible size what those fossils must be. A Tyrannosaurus Rex. I could see them quite clearly in the sunlight, as though pat waiting patiently for someone to find them. Once again, Sue Hendrickson did what a shy outsider girl had trained herself to do so well. She found them. She rushed back to the campsite, humming with the excitement, the happiness, and thrill of her find. She couldn't wait to tell the others. A Tyrannosaurus Rex! Her team immediately named the dinosaur Sue the T-Rex, after Sue Hendrickson, the finder. Then they raced to free the T-Rex from her cliff. But releasing 300 T-Rex bones in 115 degree heat under the sweltering sun without damaging the bones was neither quick nor easy. For five days, Sue and the team worked from sunrise to sunset, breaking rocks with picks and digging with shovels to remove nearly 30 feet of sandstone and hard soil. At last, the bones appeared. So many of them. The team mapped the location of each with drawings and photographs, finally with knives and brushes and smaller tools. Sue and the team removed and numbered every bone, recording them in a notebook. Nearly three weeks later, trucks bounced over 150 miles to deliver all of those bones to the Black Hills Institute. Sue the T-Rex was finally free, thanks to Sue Hendrickson, who was born to find things. After a long dispute about ownership, Sue the T-Rex went to auction. And who won the auction? None other than the Field Museum, the very same museum Sue Hendrickson loved to visit so often as a young girl. Walk into the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. 
inside Sue the T-Rex towers over you. She is the world's largest, most complete, best preserved Tyrannosaurus Rex fossil discovered so far. And she was found by Sue Hendrickson, that once shy girl, so different from the others, whose curiosity has always led her to find things and always will. The end. Oh, and you know what one of my favorite parts of this story is? Is that it is a true story. Everything in this story is true and really happened. You can really go to that museum and see that big, giant Tyrannosaurus Rex that Sue Hendrickson found. Pretty interesting and exciting, I think. All right, now we've got a really fun activity for us to do today. I just need to clean up my workstation a little bit so I have space to do it. And since this activity is a little bit messy, I'm going to take some newspaper and put it down on my cart so that I don't get my cart all messy. So in this activity, we're going to be making some of our very own fossils. Now they won't be millions of years old, like the fossils that we can find along the beach in Kenosha, but they're still really fun and really cool to make, I think. So, the things we're gonna need, I've got a bowl here for mixing up my fossil dough, and I've got some flour, I've got some salt, and I also grabbed ooh, a measuring cup so I can measure out how much stuff I need of each. And I've got a bowl of some warm water here. The warm water is gonna help us mix everything together a little bit better. So now I'm going to take my flour and I'm going to scoop out one cup. So I need to fill it up to this line here on my measuring cup. So making this activity is a little bit like baking. Have you ever baked at home before? I'll put all that flour right inside there. So bake, when you're baking things, you have to measure things out very precisely too. Okay, now I measured out one cup of, of flour, and so that means I'm going to need to measure out one half of a cup of salt. That's a lot of salt. Luckily, I have this big container of salt here. All right, that looks like a half a cup. I'm gonna put that in there. Very good. Close up my salt. Now I can kind of take my fingers and mix my salt and my flour together. Mix my dry ingredients together. And now I'm gonna take just a little bit of water. Since I used one cup of flour and a half a cup of a salt, I'm gonna to need to use maybe about a fourth of a cup of water, so not very much. But I've got this big bowl here because if I do need to add a little bit more water, I've got extras here. Just a little bit less than that. Remember, I can always add a little bit more water, but it's hard to take water out if I've added too much. So I'm gonna add my water here. And now this is the part that gets a little bit messy, but that's okay. We're gonna stir up this dough now so I can make some fossils. And you can see how it's starting to get really crumbly. There you go. And while I mix this up, let's answer some of your questions. So Elle wants to know what type of fossils can she find at Lake Michigan? So we already kind of talked about that. So the most common fossils, if you go to look for fossils along the beach, of Lake Michigan and here in Kenosha, you're gonna find a lot of crinoids. There are tons of them down there. They kind of look like little Cheerios even. That's what I usually tell people to look for, is to look for little Cheerios down by the lake because that's what I think they look like. Um, so you're gonna find a lot of those. And you might find some uh, corals and stuff too. If you're really lucky, here you have a really good eye. You might even find there are some very small fossils called bryozoans that we can find down by the lake. Right. This is getting pretty close. I think I'm going to need 
See how it's still kind of crumbly though and there's a lot of extra dry stuff? I'm gonna need to add a little bit more water, I think, to try to get all of those, those dry ingredients all mixed up into my fossil dough. Take just a, a little bit more water and add that in and keep mixing. And Aaron wants to know if there are, is one type of dinosaur that has been found all over the world. That is a very interesting, very good question. So we do find dinosaurs all over the world. We find dinosaurs on every single continent on our planet, even Antarctica. There's some really cool dinosaurs we find in Antarctica, actually, like Cryolophosaurus. I really like that dinosaur. So we find dinosaurs all over the world, but we don't find one type of dinosaur that lived all over the place. And in fact, even dinosaurs that we find here in the United States, things like Triceratops or T-Rex or Stegosaurus, didn't even live all over the whole United States. They only lived in one little part of the United States, out in the Western United States. So while we do find dinosaurs all over the world, we don't find the same dinosaur all over the world. Very interesting question. All right, now this dough is almost ready, but I think we've got, while I mix it up still a little bit more, we've got time, we got a little opportunity to answer another question. So Noel wants to know, where do people find fossils? Oh, that's a very good question. So like we said, Noel, fossils can be found all over the world, wherever we find sedimentary rocks. So sedimentary rocks, again, are rocks that are made from sand or mud or clay or silt, all pressed together to make a rock. So they can, oh, and I see you also want to know what they look like to help you identify them. Well, they look like, when you, when you take a look at sedimentary rocks, you can sometimes see the little tiny pieces of rock or even the little bits of mud or clay that make up the rock. Usually they're not shiny. Shinier rocks are usually another type of rock called an igneous rock. And those are rocks that are made inside volcanoes and things. But sedimentary rocks look like lots of little things all smushed together to make one big thing. Is an easy way to think about it. All right, see, if I take out my dough, you can see now I've got all of my salt and flour and water all mixed up into this nice lump of dough. And so I can roll this dough out now. Now this isn't dough that we would use for baking, like for cooking things or for, um, for making cookies or anything like that. This dough is not dough that you would want to eat. Do you remember how much salt we put into this? It wouldn't taste very nice if we tried to make cookies out of this dough. But we can use this dough to make fossils. All that salt in there will help to dry them out. So I can peel a little bit of my dough off like this. So I've got this extra bit there and then I can make fossils. I can peel off little blobs like this and make fossils with them. Now I could make, I'm gonna kind of flatten this one out a little bit. I could take some seashells. So here I've got some little seashells that I've got, that I found. And I can press them into the dough. I'll get a little bit closer so you can see. So I'll take my dough and my seashells and then I can press the shells into my dough to make all sorts of different fossils. Just like this. Oh, look, this one's got kind of a bunch of fun little spikes and spines on the top. I bet that'll make a really interesting fossil. Ooh, look at that. Very cool. Oh, and I've got one more. Oh, this one's really smooth, but look, it has some, some little holes and little lines taken out of it. Those are actually from like worms and bugs eating this shell. And I can see that little tiny uh, hole that was in the side of the shell that got preserved in my fossil. Now I've, so I've pressed my, my shells into my dough like that. Now I could just leave this somewhere where it's nice and dry and 
warm, like on a paper towel on the windowsill. I could leave that there for a few days. It would dry out all on its own. Or if I wanted to, I could pop it in the oven for a little while too, and that would help to dry it out and turn it into a really hard fossil. I've got all this extra dough left too though, so I could also smash this one up, make another little round fossil here, and I've got a dinosaur. I've, I really like dinosaurs, so I could also use some dinosaur toys. And I could look, I can make some dinosaur footprints by pushing my Triceratops feet into my dough too to make some little dinosaur footprint fossils. So oh, I can make so many different types of fossils with just this dough. Anything that I, that I have at home, I could make a fork fossil or I could make uh, a Lego fossil. I could push a Lego into the surface and leave an impression of my Legos in the, in the dough. There's all sorts of things we could push into the dough to make a fossil of. It's really up to you. But we've got the recipe for making this dough and making our fossils on our website too that you can go check out um, too, if you if you don't want to go back in the in our in our video and rewatch exactly how much I measured out, but we've got the recipe on our on our website too. If you want to uh, learn how to make really simple fossil dough like this to make your own fossils at home, well, thank you guys all so much for joining us today. I hope that you have a wonderful National Fossil Day. That you have fun making some fossils of your own, and I hope that you join us next week when we'll be learning all about bats. Can't wait to see you then.